Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Sleepaway Camp 2 Unhappy Campers, released in 1988. Developed after Robert Hildsick sold the rights for the series to his producer Jerry Silva, who helped him make the first movie, Sleepaway Camps Part 2 and 3 were filmed back to back and are very different from the original. While the first movie had plenty of unintentional hilarity, I believe there's a whole bag. Sleepaway Camp 2 is an outright horror comedy, since director Michael A. Simpson and writer Fritz Gordon wanted to do something different with the quote-unquote dead teenager slasher subgenre. Thus, Unhappy Campers focuses much more on humor and features so many meta moments that I'm surprised Angela doesn't straight up wink into the camera. Good night, campers. Speaking of Angela, for parts two and three she was recast since Felissa Rose was in college and didn't quite gel with the new direction of the series. Instead, the character, who has undergone sex reassignment surgery, is played by Pamela Springsteen, younger sister to the boss. Pamela didn't have a huge acting career, but I do love that her first role was in Fast Times at Ridgemont High as a cheerleader alongside Kelly Maroney, who played Final Girl Allison in Chopping Mall. I always love finding little horror connections like that. Pamela Springsteen's Angela is much more chipper and talkative than Felissa Rose's quiet portrayal, and she's got a very clear motivation for her murders. She absolutely loves summer camp and hates when kids misbehave. There's lots of good kids. We just have to weed out the bad. Those good and bad kids that Angela's gonna have to weed through are, for some reason, mostly named after 80s Brat Pack actors like Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen. I wonder if that was weird at all on set, since Final Girl Molly is played by those guys' sister, Renee Estevez. It's another meta aspect to this movie's self-aware style of humor, but thankfully, most of the cast gives some surprisingly good performances, especially Pamela Springsteen, who really makes the Angela character her own. If only more of the kill were on screen or had better special effects, this movie could have been one of my favorites. But even if they're off screen, there are still plenty of kills to count here. So let's take a trip back to summer camp and get to them. The movie begins around a campfire at Camp Rolling Hills. Wait, is that Uncle Joey telling ghost stories? One of these coolier campers, Phoebe Cates, has a story of her own and submits for the approval of the Midnight Society the tale of Camp Arawak, complete with graphic details about its victims. One of the cooks got boiled in some water. Mmm. Tasty. Hey dude, you need to cut it out. Camp counselor Angela arrives and interrupts Phoebe's story to take her back to the girls' cabin, leaving the boy campers behind to discuss the fate of the Arawak killer and the merits of government spending. He went into a psycho ward a couple years ago, and while he was there, the doctors gave him a sex change, and our parents' taxes paid for it. Like I said, this movie's humor is much more intentional than the originals, but hey, at least we still get some classic boy piles. Angela, who now goes by Angela Johnson instead of Angela Baker, great alias, does not mince words when it comes to her judgments of other people. Slut. She tells Phoebe that she doesn't deserve to be at camp, and then enforces her dogmatic beliefs by removing Phoebe from the camp roster. After using a tree branch to deliver a gloopy globby head thwack, Angela cuts out Phoebe's tongue for having such a filthy mouth. The effect isn't spectacular, but at least it's better than the dead acting on display here. There's some very obvious flinching going on there. Better just get ourselves to the title card! Play that 80s coke rock! Yeah! Feels like these opening credits are taking place inside an airplane hangar. Angela's cabin of campers in this movie is, uh, much more developed than the campers in the original film. Ha ha. Instead of actual adolescents playing pranks on each other, we've got much more grown-up sexy teens doing their usual sexy teen stuff. Like this girl Allie walking around giving us gratuitous nudity, or these Schultz sisters and their love of getting WASTED! Angela tells them all that Phoebe was sent home for being a bad girl, and speaking of which, why don't you put a top on, Allie? Nice girls don't have to show it off. Angela also breaks the news of Phoebe's early exit to camp owner Uncle John, as in John Hughes. Although Uncle John might be undercover KGB, he's thankfully not a pedophile in the mold of Mafia Mel. And he's actually very supportive of Angela's pep and camp spirit, naming her Counselor of the Week before giving her the stage in the rec hall. Before she starts a rockin', Angela calls up Molly, a virginal final girl type, and Allie, that naughty topless chick, to help her perform her favorite song, I'm a Happy Camper. Oh! Oh, I'm a happy camper, I love the summer sun. Huh, I wonder why this is her favorite song. And with the grace of God, I'll camp until I die. Oh, that's why. 
skips the death part. During the requisite rec hall scene, nice girl Molly sparks up a relationship with camp hunk Sean, and later they develop some actually believable chemistry together laying out by the pool. Their budding romance even survives a desperate attempt by promiscuous Allie to get Sean interested in her instead. <laughs> you can't just win him over with a wet t-shirt, Allie. He's not Joe Francis. After blowing off a pickup attempt by that Uncle Joey-esque lead counselor TC, short for Tom Cruise maybe, Angela creeps into the woods and finds those two Shoat sisters getting real movie drunk and real movie high. They're pretty much begging to get killed by Angela. I'm a happy camper. I love to drink and fuck. And if you pay me money on my titties, you can suck. Uh-oh. Angela is not a fan of parody artists. And she's even less a fan of exhibitionism. So when she finds one of the Shoat sisters making out with a dude the next day, she sends him away and deals with the drunken druggy sisters with her own special Angela methods. By which I mean she wakes one of the sisters up to the charred corpse of her siblings, spits out a Nancy Reagan quote, Say no to drugs. And then lights the living sister ablaze. They actually had to have the first sister be a charred skeleton here, because Amy Fields, who played her, was underage and couldn't be on set for any graphic kill scenes. That's also why she's passed out in the prior scene, instead of making out with a dude like her sister. Clearly, even the kills in this movie are more funny than scary. It's part of this movie being mostly a comedy. And you know what was the height of comedy in 80s cinema? <laughs> Yeah, panty rays! Especially when they're done with a wacky guitar backing. Angela predictably breaks up the panty party, but even though she's pissed, the girl campers make quick plans to get revenge on the guys by having a jockstrap raid. Check it out! And it's done to the exact same music, too. I think we better get out of here! That's a pretty funny riff on the panty raid trope. Good job, movie. When Angela arrives to break up this jock jam, she gets inadvertently flashed by camper Mayor Winningham. That accidental eyeful enrages Angela enough to murder Mayor that night with a power drill in the passenger seat of her car. Car, which in real life was owned by the special effects makeup artist for this movie, Bill Splat Johnson. The next day, Angela's enjoying some post-murder quiet time when Molly finds her chilling at this abandoned cabin. Molly confides in Angela about her relationship with Sean and her trepidation since Allie likes him too. And because Molly is a good girl, Angela is friendly and supportive. Sean's smart. He knows a good thing when he sees it. Aw, oh, that's nice. She's still super judgmental about others, though. Allie... She's more experienced. Mmm. Which means that she probably has a disease or two. Yeah, Angela doesn't like anything having to do with sex. And she's definitely not a fan of these two little turds, Charlie and Emilio, who have spent the whole movie taking peeping Tom shots of the constantly topless female campers. Angela catches them and is shocked to discover a near nude of herself in their collection. Damn, what do you think? I think they're dead meat. Real dead meat. And as if those pre-adolescent perverts weren't bad enough, Angela's also gotta worry about campers Anthony Michael Hall and Judd Nelson. Nelson, who plot to get back at her for being such a buzzkill, all while she's clearly within earshot. Angela will dookie in her pants. Yeah, high five for dookie, brah. That night, they set out on their plan to scare her, with Anthony dressed as Fisherman Pizza Face Kruger, and Judd looking like Jason, if Mr. Voorhees were a street hockey goalie. Anthony loses his finger knives and finds them perched upon a log, where they promptly slit his throat. Damn, Tony, Freddy went like eight movies never cutting himself. At least, you know, unintentionally. And you get killed with your own finger knives your first night out with them? Amateur. Then the character dressed like the killer from my first ever Kill Count franchise is attacked by one dressed like the killer from my latest Kill Count franchise. Cause look at Angela's costume. Oh, it's fucking Leatherface! And as Bubba Jr. Tom Jed, she kills Judd with a chainsaw slash to the leg, followed by an off-screen butchering against the ground. Now Angela, you'd better stay in character and eat that body. You never want to half-ass a roll. There are a couple of scenes with characters talking, and a couple of scenes with characters fucking, before before we finally get to the next kill, after Allie finds a note, ostensibly from Sean, telling her to meet him later. She goes to the abandoned cabin rendezvous and finds Angela waiting for her instead, who voices her disapproval of Allie's lifestyle before stabbing her in the back a couple of times with a knife. She then drags the injured Allie into an old outhouse and shoves her into the shithole, stamping her down with a stick into the cesspool of feces and leeches. Oh god, that's so gross! And the sound effects, man? <laughs> that shit pit's not 
full of scope, Allie. Close your mouth. She's ultimately killed via septic drowning, with Angela's only regret being how long it took her to do it. You should have been the first to go. This whole time, to cover up for all her murders, Angela has been saying that the actually dead campers have been getting sent home for misbehavior. That story begins to crumble when camper Demi Moore tells Angela that, full disclosure, she called the homes of Phoebe and Mare and that both their parents said they were still at camp. After a lengthy gag wherein Angela tests a few good murder weapons, she settles on a guitar string, which she uses to strangle the camper with full throttle. Talk about a rough night for Demi there. Bet she never expected to leave Camp Rolling Hills as a ghost. The deadly comedy of errors continues when another camper, Leah Thompson, walks into the cabin. But she hasn't done anything naughty, so killing her would break Angela's rules, wouldn't it? I didn't do anything! You're gonna tell. Oh, I guess Angela's playing by whose line slash Calvin Ball slash kill count rules. They're not that important. After a romantic goodnight kiss from Sean, Molly enters her cabin to find it completely cleared out, and Angela telling her that they're the only ones left. You sent all of them home? She certainly did, Molls. But if it makes you feel any better, she's not sleeping easy over it, because that night, Angela has slow motion nightmares of everything she's done so far. It's my favorite. The happy this two-minute dream sequence was literally added to the movie in order to get it from 78 minutes up to 80, the feature length that the filmmakers were contractually obligated to fulfill. That's why it consists of the exact same footage we've already seen, only with a blue filter over it. The next day, Angela gets fired by Uncle John for sending all of his campers home. Can't really have a summer camp without campers, you know? She goes to her quiet place to cry, and after Molly and Sean come by to try to cheer her up, Sean ends up going inside the abandoned cabin and finding a whole bunch of camper corpses. We get a bunch of quick shots of all of their bodies, but the mediocre makeup effects make it kinda hard to know who I'm looking at sometimes. While Sean's dry heaving over all this newfound death, Angela comes in and beats him down with a stick. Shh, Molly. Just stay a good girl, okay? Molly and Sean are tied up in the cabin as Angela gives them unsolicited opinions about fried food. I'm a nut when it comes to french fries. At one point, they hear TC running through the woods and calling out for them, but when he gets to the cabin, Angela's ready to greet him. This is battery acid, you slime. It really is, too. Taken from TC's car battery. I knew your battery would come in handy. That's true. You never know when you might need to melt a face. Sean realizes that Angela Johnson is Angela Baker, the camp air killer, and although she claims that she's okay now, I'm completely cured. Sean knows better, since his dad was a cop who helped arrest her. Oh shit, Sean, is your dad Officer Fake Stash? How's the stash doing? It's probably doing better than Sean's head, cause that thing's flying right off thanks to Angela and a machete. If only heads were as easy to fake as mustaches. But judging by the one in that TV set, they are not. Angela leaves Molly in her fly-filled cabin of death, and the next time we see her, she's dragging another corpse, some random camper named Matt through the woods to join the party at her cabin. By time Angela gets there, though, Molly has already freed herself, and she surprises Angela with a branch beatdown before fleeing into the woods. A pretty boring chase scene ensues until Molly falls off a rock and knocks herself out, which seemingly upsets Angela. Poor Molly. It's any consolation. You almost made it. The sun sets once again, and back at camp, counselor Diane Lane finds the strung up bodies of those shitbirds Emilio and Charlie, as well as the severed hand and corpse of Uncle John, and the hanging body of camper Rob, who mostly spent this movie getting his rocks off with Allie. Angela, who was waiting behind the door in the office, kills Diane with a couple of stabs to the gut and a twist. And that's lights out for pretty much everyone at Camp Rolling Hills. <sighs> Good night, campers. Angela leaves camp and gets a ride from a random cowgirl lady who assures her it was no biggie. Ain't no skin off my tits. That kind of colorful language and her bad smoking habit gets this truck lady killed by self-designated moral police officer Angela. Damn, after she was giving you a free ride too, Ange? In the woods, Molly wakes up and makes her way out to a road, but unfortunately for her, it's Angela who stops to pick her up. Come in, partner! <laughs> Oh, wait, that that's the end? Oh, shit, okay, uh, sure, let's get to the numbers, I guess. 18 people died in Sleepaway Camp 2, a pretty respectable kill count. 
The victims included nine men and nine women, giving us a perfectly even pie chart. And with a runtime of 80 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.44 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Allie. It's easily the most memorable kill of the movie, and a pretty unique one. Plus, I've gotta give props to actor Valerie Hartman, who had to get all those gross fake leeches put on her face. She even had to keep them on during a lunch break on set. Good luck keeping that meal down. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to that Matt guy, because, like, who the fuck even was he? And that's it. Sleepaway Camp 2, Unhappy Campers, came out in 1988 and was immediately followed by the third film, Teenage Wasteland. I'll look at that one next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Thomas Horton, Travis Jenner, Zane Johnson, Major Fail Gaming, Jason Pendergast, and Owen Glassberg. You can be a cool patron like them and get lots of rewards by following the link in the description. Don't forget the first ever Dead Meat Live show is coming up at RTX on Sunday, July 7th. You can get tickets at the link in the description. Be good people.